participate in this meeting as well as other people from around the world and uh, throughout the country in our movement and to give uh, people an opportunity to hear from them uh, because they experienced this tour uh, just as I did. I, the question of uh, going to Russia, people uh, raised a question with me about it. I did a, a radio interview and uh, somebody asked me, uh, there was a radio show in Washington, D.C. It's a very popular show in Washington, D.C. And the host of the radio show uh, uh, asked me, uh, did not think uh, it was possible uh, that the Russians who invited me to, uh, to come there uh, had done so in order to use me uh, in some fashion against the United States. And um, I thought it was an incredible kind of question, and it was startling uh, kind of question. It was uh, not easy for me uh, to respond to it in, uh, in, with a straight face um, because I didn't understand how uh, the notion of Russians using me uh, by inviting me to Russia uh, could even be some kind of factor, could even be something that somebody would think about. Uh, and uh, the fact is that I went there uh, to do what I could to use the Russians. Uh, the fact is that uh, we have a situation uh, where we are involved in a life and death struggle with the U.S. imperialism and have been uh, forever. And uh, for the longest period of time, subsequent to the defeat of the Black Revolution of the 1960s, we've been uh, in a state of near isolation. And it's important to us to be able to establish and identify allies all around the world who can unite with us uh, in this struggle that we have with this terrorist organization uh, that calls itself the United States government. And I didn't understand why the brother who asked me that question uh, didn't understand that. And the truth of the matter is, uh, any uh, casual objective examination of history uh, will show that uh, Russians, uh, uh, Russia has done more uh, for the liberation of African people here and around the world uh, than anything America has ever done. And Russia has had to go up against American interests in order to advance uh, the struggle of African people, whether here or any place around the world. And during uh, my development as a political activist, I had to encounter over and over again uh, uh, charges by uh, supporters and, and uh, uh, operatives of the United States government, by media sources, etc., uh, that I was involved in a struggle for freedom and liberation because I was being paid by the Russians. Uh, so that was quite a statement to me that uh, there was a notion that somehow the Russians would pay me uh, to get free. Uh, the Americans definitely weren't paying anybody to get free, and America was doing everything they could to make sure I never saw freedom. So I just thought that was a strange uh, kind of question, but I think it was maybe typical of how uh, many people understand some things that's happening in the world today. How did I get to Russia? Well. We got an invitation uh, from an organization uh, whose banner should have been up here by now, and it's a state about this organization that it is, it is not up here, uh, that is known as the Anti-Globalization uh, Movement of Russia. And uh, this Anti-Globalization Movement of Russia uh, is an organization that uh, defines itself as being committed to struggling to establish relationship between peoples and nations and going uh, around uh, governments in order to do that. And uh, it defines itself as being interested in uh, uh, creating a multipolar world, world. Uh, and which is to say that it's a struggle against U.S. hegemony, a U.S. domination of the world where the United States assumes uh, uh, the ability and right uh, to determine how everything should happen in the world uh, based uh, essentially on the fact that they've got all the guns. They've got nuclear weapons, they, uh, uh, and especially with the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, this is how uh, the U.S. had, had seen uh, itself and seen the world for a long period of time. 
And as most people uh, in this room are aware, uh, over the last uh, several years, uh, there has a real crisis of uh, this whole international social system has become more and more obvious. Uh, and it manifests itself, this crisis, in a thousand different ways. But uh, one of the outstanding uh, features of this crisis is the growing resistance of oppressed peoples around the world to uh, the established uh, social order uh, that uh, it represents itself uh, in, in the form of people everywhere fighting uh, to overturn this relationship they have with imperialism. So uh, in South America, that's the case, has been for a while now. Uh, as soon as the United States thought that it was, uh, uh, had a reached its place uh, where it had absolute domination, uh, Fidel Castro they were anticipating would be dead any moment. And then they look up, there's Hugo Chavez, and there's the struggle of people in Venezuela, and then in the wake of that, there's Ecuador, there's Bolivia. Uh, every place they look, the people in South America, uh, that used to be referred to as the backyard of the United States, the people were taking back their resources and struggling to uh, assume control uh, of their future for themselves. And this was a, a, a terrible uh, thing for the U.S. to have to have to deal with uh, because the whole economy, the economic order of the world has been created uh, through a parasitic uh, 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 theft of uh, human and material resources of the people of the world. Capitalism itself got established through slavery and through colonialism and uh, now uh, the whole world economy it has been organized around that and now everybody is fighting to free themselves uh, from this system. And so it creates a uh, crisis, and uh, this crisis is made manifest in places uh, in the Middle East uh, where people uh, just won't uh, agree, just want to unite with the United States and, and Europe that they should simply uh, suffer uh, uh, without uh, any assumption of a future for themselves and their children uh, so that oil could be cheaply supplied uh, to people in the United States and Europe. Uh, people have decided that they want to be able uh, to determine the future for their children, even if that means fighting against the U.S. And of course, that's essentially what it does mean, because the U.S. has been the great hegemon in the world. It has been the determining factor about who will be free and who won't be free. And so this crisis that we see is a, is a consequence, or it's, it manifests itself uh, in the struggle of people uh, there, uh, in the rise of China. Uh, who is uh, a new imperial uh, force itself but on the make, but it's uh, still one that challenges the status quo. Uh, the, the assumption of the United States and Western Europe uh, would dominate the world, and now there's China that's hungry itself, uh, and a growing influence and challenging the U.S. hegemony not only in Asia, uh, but as the growing economic force on the continent of Africa. Uh, and when we mention places like Asia, Africa, South America, these are not just locations in the world. These are places where tremendous amounts of resources are located that feeds the capitalist machine that has been usually historically under the leadership of Europe and North America. Now there's a fundamental change, a challenge to that relationship. And uh, of course, as you know, uh, subsequent uh, to uh, the collapse uh, of the Soviet Union, uh, something that was uh, uh, accelerated uh, by the policies of James Earl Carter, uh, who a lot of people like to remember as the last good president, uh, but who is really uh, the guy through his uh, national security advisor uh, that created the modern jihad. Uh, the jihad that the United States claims that is fighting uh, in places uh, in the Middle East and North Africa, they were created by the United States government. And they were created uh, as a means to challenge uh, the Soviet Union uh, that was uh, supporting uh, the, 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 the struggle of, uh, and the existence of the people in Afghanistan and the objective by Brzezinski, who was Carter's national security advisor, was to create a Vietnam for uh, the Soviet Union uh, that would drain its resources, uh, that would create enemies that they would have to fight uh, in the same way Vietnam, uh, this unjust, uh, terroristic colonial war 
of the United States uh, 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 resulted in loss of resources and lives and things like that for the United States. And so uh, uh, the United States and Carter's uh, administration helped to create uh, this modern jihad that the U.S. finds itself fighting now. If there's a 9-11, if it was true, uh, then uh, Carter started it. Carter and Brzezinski created that situation. They are the ones who organized those forces and then sent them in. They trained them, they armed them, uh, and sent them into Afghanistan. And this is the thing that's morphed and changed uh, into the, the uh, Taliban and Al-Qaeda and all these other manifestations that you see of you know, the jihad out there in the world today. That's what they have to fight against. Uh, so so uh, this crisis is there. And, and the fact is that uh, it's a logical conclusion because uh, just because the people were against uh, 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 the Russians in Afghanistan or the Soviets in Afghanistan did not mean they loved the United States. <laughs> and so the United States armed them to the teeth and trained them uh, and uh, turned them into some of the most competent fighters uh, in the world today. And you see that uh, with the so-called Islamic State. And, and you see that uh, uh, with jihad, with the Taliban, that they cannot defeat. They cannot defeat the Taliban. And you're talking about the Taliban in a place like Afghanistan where the people are so hungry, they don't even have resources for bread for their children. And the United States has been there for 12, 13 years, and they cannot defeat those people there. Uh, and so you have this crisis that's out there. And, and uh, you have a realignment of political forces that's happening in the world today uh, that's challenging the whole hegemony, not only of America, but Europe itself. Uh, there's a whole shift in the balance of, uh, of uh, forces in the world. Uh, so that we define this as a, a magnificent contest between the past uh, and the future. Uh, the past being a past of colonialism and slavery, uh, where U.S. and European imperialism, white power dominated uh, the whole world, sucked the blood of the whole world. It's represented in the fact that in this world today, 80% of the people on the planet are trying to survive off less than, uh, $10 or less a day. 80% of the human beings on this earth, 50% uh, of the human beings on this earth are trying to survive off $2.50 or less a day. And in Africa, uh, people are lucky if they can get a dollar a day. That's the kind of uh, political and economic organization that has come as a consequence of this, uh, the ascension of capitalism in the world. That people have uh, mistakenly, and uh, I say mistakenly, but some of them, it hasn't been a mistake. Uh, they have declared capitalism has been the most efficient uh, uh, economic system and it has resulted in, in, in the rapid uh, uh, economic development in, uh, of the world. And of course, it's done just the opposite. Uh, because what capitalism has done is lock the vast majority of humanity out of the economic process, out of productivity, out of economic development. Yeah. That's why 80% of the people uh, are having a one uh, way of uh, trying to survive uh, where 20% of the people are living well. That's capitalism. So obviously that's not this rapid, magnificent development. That's rapid and magnificent development of Europe and North America at the expense of Africa and the other oppressed peoples around the world. Got a whole economic social system. And if you got an economic system that comes, that, that functions this way, that's born of this process of slavery and colonialism, uh, what happens in society, society is uh, comprised of an economic base, right? An economic base uh, and a superstructure that responds to that particular base. And when you talk about a superstructure, you're talking about not only things like the political institutions, culture, ideas, the ideology uh, uh, of, that, uh, of that, that rests upon that economic base is one that, uh, that reinforces uh, the existence of the base that explains uh, that reality for everybody else in the world. That's why people talk about racism, racism, racism. It's natural. It's natural what they call racism, uh, I'll use that term uh, for this moment, uh, because uh, the ideas in the heads of the white people and others uh, uh, reflects the economic base of the society itself. When you got a society born of slavery 
and the colonialism of the vast majority of the people in the world and the institutions and ideas that spring from that economic base uh, will represent that, that reality. It will represent that reality. So that there's no way you can get around that. If you got an economic system based on slavery, and it teaches a, 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 a freedom and liberation and revolution, uh, uh, then something is amiss here. And you won't have that from that economic base. That economic base based on slavery will teach the, uh, the wonders of slavery, how wonderful it is, how it is really a beacon of democracy for all, everybody, and we've got the guns and everything to make everybody agree uh, with that. That's what that kind of uh, reality will, will create. So the idea is simply a reflection of the economic base of the society itself. Uh, but increasingly what's been happening is oppressed people have been breaking free, and in the process of breaking free, They've also been challenging the existing narrative. They've been challenging the imperial narrative. They've been challenging the basic narrative that's defined this reality for everybody in the world. And so the slave has found her voice and is beginning to talk. And this sector of the population that always has been able to define itself as the subject of history and the rest of us as objects of history, this sector of the population now finds itself having to hear from the slave and the colonized who now are stepping forward and becoming subjects of history in our own right and then for the first time uh, the ones who define the existing narrative uh, find uh, themselves now uh, existing as objects of history from the perspective of the slave and the oppressed. And that creates a real disturbing uh, uh, a sense of, of uh, well-being uh, among the oppressor nations, uh, among the colonizer population, uh, because they've never heard this before. The slave has never dared to speak up. Emmett Till whistled and died for it. You can't say anything uh, living under, you can't even talk back to the cop in your community. I mean, the brutality to make sure that the a prevailing narrative of the oppressor is the one that continues to explain reality, that's something that's there. Except now there was a Hugo Chavez, there was a Fidel, and there was a, uh, there was a Che Guevara, and there was a Malcolm X, and there was a Patrice Lumuma, and there was a Kwame Nkrumah, and there was a Ben Bella. Uh, all of these people now are standing up and speaking a language that has been unheard of uh, before. And uh, so, anyway, this crisis uh, is something that now represents itself uh, in the form of permanent warfare. It's not just one little war over here. Uh, it's permanent warfare. Everywhere you look up, there's war. There's threats of war. And there has been war going on now 14, 15 years uh, against uh, some of the most impoverished people on the planet Earth. And now what has happened is the U.S. had moved uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, it has been uh, rapidly moving to take up all the uh, political uh, territory uh, uh, in that area of the Soviet Union. And post, uh, uh, post some of the uh, entities, uh, countries, and what have you that were once a part of the Soviet Union, now are not part of the Soviet Union. And uh, they have been, uh, they, the United States has been pushing and pushing NATO bases in those areas. Uh, and putting missiles and things like that in those areas. And the objective, of course, is to contain, continue the containment of uh, what used to be the Soviet Union, now to contain Russia, to make sure that Russia cannot contend with U.S. and imperialist interests in that region. They want to dominate all of that region, and a strong Russia uh, would prohibit that. So put up NATO bases, surround Russia to make sure that it can never be a threat to the interests of the United States. And that's what we've been... That's what is, has been going on. So the U.S. Uh, uh, actually uh, engineered a coup in Ukraine. Yes. Uh, the people had elected a president, and the U.S. Uh, actually engineered uh, through its agents a coup yes. and chased the existing president out of Ukraine. Yes. And once uh, and, and it revolved around the question of whether or not uh, Ukraine would be allied with Russia or whether Ukraine would be allied with U.S. through Europe. And uh, so the U.S. supported its own forces and 
made it, uh, uh, pushed this force out, and then ends up taking, uh, uh, having an election on the, under those terms, their terms, uh, uh, that got their guy uh, in power. And uh, what happened uh, was, of course, uh, the objective there was to, uh, was to establish NATO bases and to uh, just go right up to the border uh, of Russia. And while it's forgotten, that Ukraine has historically been connected to Russia. Yeah. And that uh, especially in eastern Ukraine, uh, there are essentially Russians, Russian speakers, Russians who live there. And uh, it was only Khrushchev's gesture uh, 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 some several years ago, I guess that might have been in what, the 50s or 60s, uh, that resulted in the, uh, 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 what they call uh, Ukraine uh, being separated from uh, the rest of Russia. And what must be understood also is when I was uh, in uh, uh, Moscow, uh, it was they, the Russians were celebrating the 70th, 70th anniversary of the Russian defeat of the Nazi army, of Hitler's army. And most people here don't understand that it was the Russians who crushed uh, the uh, Hitler's army, uh, the Nazis, because they like to, you get fed Pavlov that talks about how the U.S. won World War, that's what they call World War II. But the United States didn't even enter the war until 1944, okay. right? So it didn't even play a significant role uh, uh, until 1944 when it entered the war. But Russia, the Russians, and the reason why is because they sat on, on the sideline because they wanted to see Hitler and the Nazis destroy the Soviet Union. They wanted the, the Soviet Union destroyed because the Soviet Union was a revolutionary society based on the assumption of the working class, the working people being the authority in society as opposed to the bourgeoisie, the capitalist class. And they hated that. So they wanted to see the Soviet Union destroyed. And so they sat back uh, for Hitler to destroy the Soviet Union. And they underestimated the will. Uh, of the Russian people, and of course they underestimated the strength of the Communist Party uh, in, in, in the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, that must be clearly stated because uh, the, the more than 26 million uh, Russians died in that war. Uh, and there's not a Russian there uh, that did not lose a family member in that great war. Uh, but they crushed Hitler. And then after they crushed Hitler, there came this race for Berlin. Who was going to capture Berlin? And, and this race uh, uh, happened between the U.S. and the British and Russia. And of course, uh, we may have, uh, uh, we are live now on the Hura News, uh, by the way, so the live streaming is occurring. Uh, so the, the, the Soviet Union uh, got to Berlin. And I uh, have an opportunity to be at this magnificent museum of the uh, of the, uh, the Russian uh, defeat of the Nazis in 1945, and they have parts of the edifices that came from uh, the Reichstag in Berlin, Germany, sitting in the museum. And they got pictures of the Russians holding up the red flag, you know, at the capital in Berlin. Uh, and so the Russians took it, and they paid a dear uh, a price uh, for that struggle. And uh, so. So now we have the situation where China is contending, Iran is contending, Iraq is unstable and, and growing uh, under the control more and more every day of uh, influence of Iran. Uh, uh, Lebanon is unstable, uh, growing more and more as a uh, consequence of Hezbollah's influence, uh, uh, under the influence of Iran. Uh, and uh, Syria uh, is being destroyed now in part because of the influence of Iran and because it was an independent force that could not be controlled absolutely uh, by the United States government, even though it had collaborated uh, at different times with the United States government. Yeah. Uh, uh, Libya was wiped out because it also represented a threat to U.S. interests in the Middle East, particularly around that illegitimate, hostile, white nationalist settler state of Israel. Yeah. So a whole new change was happening in the whole globe. Uh, more forces were rising up, challenging the hegemony of, uh, of a European and, and U.S. white power. And now here's Russia, 
uh, and they pushed Russia and pushed Russia, and all of these Russian leaders had made concessions to the United States uh, until Putin. Yeah. And so when Putin arrived, uh, and Putin is no socialist uh, or anything like that, but he, he is a Russian patriot. Uh, he's a Russian nationalist, among other things. And so uh, what happened was that, uh, and now Russia is recovering economically because it had a severe economic crisis over a period of time. And it had reached a state of some recovery, was able to arm itself to be able to feed the people in a decent way again, and it was able to push back against U.S. encroachment uh, in that area of the world. And, and uh, even though they had worked to seduce uh, Putin and Russia by trying to include it into this thing that they call the G7, the Global Seven. This is the group of so-called economic powerhouses that wanted to define uh, the economy of the world and say how everybody would be able to eat or not be able to eat. And so they brought Russia on board to make it a, a part of the thing, the team. Uh, but Russia didn't play ball correctly because they would not give up Ukraine just because of that. And, and uh, so there's been this ongoing sanctioning, they call it sanctioning against Russia. Uh, and the objective is to punish Russia uh, for not cooperating in its own uh, surrender, uh, for not cooperating in its own submission. Yeah. And so they uh, put up sanctions because Russia is not serious. No. Because Russia uh, is not uh, 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 Libya. Right? Uh, because uh, to, to one of the Russian commentators that's quite popular in Russia today had made the statement that Russia is the only country that could turn America into a nuclear axe. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you don't go into Russia like you go into Syria. You don't go into Russia like you go into Libya. Uh, you have to have second thoughts about how you move with Russia. And so this has been extremely problematic, even though you've got frothing at the mouth reactionaries in this country like John McCain yeah. and others who are talking about they need to uh, uh, go ahead and do everything they can and arm the people in Ukraine. And the Ukrainian government is a thuggish government. It's a thuggish, uh, corrupt government. And you, what you have to understand in Ukraine, the Russians paid a dear price uh, during the Second Imperialist War, World War II in Ukraine, because they are the ones who fought and crushed the fascists in Ukraine. Yeah. The Russians did that. And that's what they're fighting today in Ukraine with all of these so-called democratic forces that uh, supposedly represents peace and progress. They're fascists. Yeah, no. They are left over from Hitler's uh, regime. Yeah. That's what they are. And the yeah. Russians are the ones who are standing up in America and England and all these countries are talking about how the Russians are violating international law and international norms, etc. And Putin is a demon. No. Right? So, and, and uh, so that's the, 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 that's the context uh, uh, that we go into the United States, into, into Moscow. We go into Moscow under this, within this context. We go into Moscow while the United States in particular is pushing uh, to, uh, to force uh, sanctions and make the Russians pay a price. And the objective being to cause pain in the Russian population that would turn them against Putin, yeah. right? Uh, and that could facilitate some form of regime change uh, in Russia uh, and or force the Russians to change their policies. But I'm telling you, I was only in, in Moscow for a few days. But it was long enough to tell you that they are crazy if they think that's going to work. I'm telling you, I was there. And I was there from, I got off the airplane in Russia going to a meeting and, and I was in meetings up until 3 o'clock in the morning sometime, every day that I was there, in and out, nothing but meetings all over Moscow. And I would tell you this, that Moscow, first of all, 15 million people in Moscow. Yeah. There is no evidence of pain in Moscow at all. Mm. Unless uh, the person who is selling all of these transparencies that people put in the back of their car windows, and they got all kinds of modern cars, don't think that Russia is some kind of backwater, etc. Uh, and there's no pain unless the person who's making all the money uh, make, selling these transparencies that they put in the back of their window that says Obama is a creep. <laughs> Heard of itself. Uh, the persons who uh, were making those injured themselves, there's no pain that I saw uh, in Moscow. 
And in Moscow is a city of 15 million people. And I've gone to the supermarkets, and I've, I've traveled everywhere, I'm telling you, all over Moscow. Uh, the striking thing about Moscow uh, is the modernity, but it's not just modern, plastic modern that you see in, in America. Uh, that uh, you see, uh, you see Russian history uh, in the architecture, uh, uh, and you see it even uh, in the modern uh, uh, edifices that you can find there. And uh, it is the cleanest city I've ever been in. And it's striking because uh, in Moscow, uh, you know how it is in some cities uh, in this country where you only park on some time of the week, you park on one side of the street because the person, the guys are going to come and sweep the streets and uh, on that day, well that was happening all day, every day in Moscow. All the streets, all the time. In the public squares, there's a thing coming along sweeping the streets. And in the interstate, when you're riding on the highway, there are these vehicles going down, washing down the highways. It's an extraordinary clean city. And in a city of 15 million people, for the days that I was there, I went every place. I was on the subways and every place else. In a city of 15 million people, I only saw one beggar. And in a city this small, in St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, you can't walk uh, for 15 minutes without seeing a beggar, uh, uh, etc. This is the people who are supposed to be suffering from the sanctions uh, there. Uh, where in this country, you got under every underpass somebody with a cardboard sign that said, Feed me, I'm hungry. Uh, standing in front of every convenience store, somebody with a styrofoam cup, you know, uh, begging for stuff. That's not Russia. You do not see that in Russia. And I, I think it's really important uh, to understand that. They are not hurting. The people are not hurting in that fashion. But the bigger thing that's being missed here is the patriotism yeah. and the courage of the Russian people itself. Russian society, even though it is not a socialist society at this moment, modern Russian society is a child of the Bolshevik Russian socialist revolution. Modern Russian society is a child of the socialist revolution. Lenin brought a, a, a modern social uh, Russian, a modern Russian society into existence, and it was a society uh, that was born in the that 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 achieved this character, that developed, uh, uh, came out of this semi-feudal state of the shock. Uh, under the leadership of the Bolsheviks, it was a society that came into existence fighting in the interests of the poor and the oppressed and the working class. It is a society where it may be that everybody in Russia didn't believe in it, but the Soviet Union is the place where they actually gave arms and support to the struggle of people in Vietnam to fight against U.S. imperialism and to fight against U.S. interests. That's the Russian people that we're talking about. It was the Russians. I went to uh, one place I went to uh, in Moscow uh, that it used to be called uh, the Patrice Lumumba University, named after the leader in the Congo that was murdered by U.S. CIA agents and French and Belgian uh, agents, etc. And uh, in this uh, uh, university, uh, it was created to train uh, revolutionaries in Africa and other places to fight for freedom. Yeah. That the Russian people participated in making that happen. Yeah. Their tax dollars, their support, their, their resources went to facilitate that. It was the Russians who supported the struggle in Cuba. It was the Russians who supported the Chinese Revolution. Yeah. It was the Russians who supported the struggle in Vietnam. It was the Russians who sent through Cuba the Katrusha rockets that was used to defeat the South African terrorists in Angola. The Russians did that. The Russians did that. And that has had to have had an impact on the Russian population. That modern Russian society has its origin in that, even though it was under the leadership of the socialists. You see what I'm saying? And what was really striking was everywhere I went, just how open and warm uh, the Russians were, everywhere. And uh, I got off the airplane, I had stopped just long enough to take a shower, didn't have an iron or anything, throw on something, you go to a meeting, and the first meeting I went to, there was uh, uh, at a site that used to be the place where the Warsaw Pact uh, used to meet. 
and uh, uh, it was uh, it was a federation of uh, of uh, Russian uh, migrants, the, Confeder the Federation of Russian Migrants, a conference of the Federation of Russian Migrants, and uh, the Russian migrants are a lot of people from different places, essentially from what used to be the former Soviet Union and other places in that region. Many of them live uh, in Russia, uh, but the Russian government has facilitated their ability to have this organization that looks out for their interests as people who are living in Russia uh, from other places. And so they have these conferences on a regular basis. And the keynote speaker at this conference was the uh, Syrian ambassador to, to, to Russia. And a lot of uh, other people, I mean, there was a round table with uh, a lot of people there. And uh, I had an opportunity to say a few words uh, there uh, as well. And uh, I, I think that the Russian people want to see uh, people who uh, disagree with the policies of the United States government uh, toward Russia. And uh, they didn't have to scratch hard when they came to me. <laughs> you understand? And I was quite explicit, explicit in my statement. And I was helping to say, and I think this is important, that the Russian people uh, and the Russian government should never have to be in some defensive posture uh, when it comes to a propaganda struggle against the United States government. The first thing that must be understood by everybody in the world, that the United States is not a, a normal, if you will, a so-called nation. Uh, that the United States is more akin to the state of Israel. It is, a, a, it is an entity, a state, uh, that was founded on stolen land. Yeah. Where you have a group of people leave someplace else and come and take somebody else's land, and the, the traditional custodians of the land, those who remain essentially, are in concentration camps that they call Indian reservations. Yeah. I said that what you must understand, and what you must begin to use uh, in your ideological debates with the United States, is that uh, the United States has an exist stole half of Mexico. Yeah. And when you look at California, uh,
finding all kinds of excuses to have me stay, stay there longer. Comrade, comrade, you know, this is what was going on, you know? And, uh, and I said, you know, what, what, what you eat? He said, no, I'm a vegetarian. Get some vegetables, get something for this guy. I said, I don't, I don't want anything to eat, I just ate, you know, but this is, this is the hospitality that they demonstrated. And then, uh, uh, from there, uh, uh, and, and all of this didn't happen, you know, like in the same sequence, because every night, every day, it just, they all rolled into one. Uh, but I spoke to what used to be the Patrice Lumumba Coalition, uh, Patrice Lumumba uh, University. I went there, uh, the vice president was the person who uh, introduced me or, or set it up, and then the, uh, the person who moderated in this, in this meeting that I had with uh, students, must have been 50, 60, 70 students there, uh, was the person who might be characterized as the dean of students. Had a great discussion there. Uh, and again, my message is the same there as it was in the Federation meeting with the Russian migrants, and my message is the same, that people should not uh, uh, be uh, uh, seduced by, uh, by this nonsense of U.S., the beacon, the shining, beacon, the shining city on the hill, the beacon for democracy, that that ain't nothing that anybody who lives there uh, is experiencing. This is America that I want to tell you about. I want to tell you about the United States of America. And so that was a good meeting. And at that place, uh, they, they created this magnificent spread. I think that's going to be like uh, uh, on the video that we showed to eat. Problem was that I couldn't eat anything but bread and grapes because I'm a vegan. And they had, and the Russians uh, haven't got that down pat yet. Uh, not the ones that we were hanging with. And uh, so uh, while I was there, they gave me gifts. And, this pen is a gift from the dean, what would be the dean of students uh, right here. I think this person may have been something like uh, Armenian, et cetera, and this is uh, some pen that I got uh, from them, and uh, it was just a really great session. Uh, and, and, <laughs> and they like toasting a lot. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and they said that you can't have the Russian experience unless you have some Russian vodka, and I said, I'm gonna have to miss that part. <laughs> And, uh, and the thing, the process that, that is that you, you you toast and you have a shot of vodka and then you talk and discuss everything. After a while, you pour some more, you stand up and you do another toast and another shot of vodka. So they were toasting all uh, uh, throughout this process. Uh, so I could, I was toasting water. Yeah, I was toasting water. So we, we went through that. We, and I only have a few minutes because I talked a lot. The, because uh, we had this problem with the internet that I thought the state had taken us down and didn't want, want this to be uh, something that everybody could share with us. Uh, and so uh, we went to the criminal and I saw, now you talk about the White House and all of this stuff, you know, uh, Whitehall in London, the criminal, what an extraordinary, magnificent edifice. The, this is a seat, the lack like of power in government uh, in Russia. And it's an extraordinary place. And I went to Red Square. You know, this is the place that they used to show you in the newsreels and on the movies where they want to tell you how bad the Russians were. Look at them. They've got all these weapons just rolling by. Stalin standing at the top of the thing. This magnificent thousands of troops passing through Red Square. I was at Red Square. I went to Lenin's Mausoleum. Uh, it was closed, so I couldn't go in uh, there. But I was, I was at the mausoleum. Uh, you're going to see some footage of uh, the changing of the guard uh, at the uh, Eternal Flame uh, in Red Square. What a magnificent sight that is. And this is from the old Soviet period, right, uh, in Moscow. To see these, these guys and you say, wow, that's what power looks like. <laughs> you understand? Uh, and, and so we had that experience and we went to the museum, the, the uh, museum of the, the wall uh, that they have created that uh, is just fabulous. You, you wouldn't believe it. It went to the, to the, uh, the subways. It went down uh, into the subways. Uh, uh, this ain't no New York subway. This is the cleanest, most efficient subway you ever want to see. And you go down there, there's no graffiti there because people wouldn't mark it up. It's got art here. It's got statues over here that shows the Soviet people uh, and from the, from the Soviets, from the Russian Revol from the Soviet Revolution, it, it shows the, 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 the Kronstadt uh, sailors, you know, armed to the teeth who, who fought against the Tsar and uh, against the uh, 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 Russian uh, uh, feudal uh, society, etc. Uh, you've got women in arms and whatever. It's just a magnificent uh, situation to be there. Statue of Lenin uh, in there. Went to 
Karl Marx Square, a huge statue of Karl Marx, an idealized uh, statue of Karl Marx that was there. Big sign across the street saying, uh, uh, proletarians of the world unite, you understand? Uh, this is the stuff that, that, that's been feeding the, the, the Russian people all these years uh, since the, 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 the overturn of Tsardom uh, and capitalism uh, in Russia. This is the people that Obama is stupid enough to think that, that some sanctions is going to be able to bring them to the knees. The people who, who lost 26 million people fighting against the Nazis. They, they think they're going to bring them crazy. And so the, the Russian people were extraordinarily uh, open during this process. And then uh, we went uh, also to the headquarters of the, uh, the anti-globalization movement. Uh, where I did a, uh, another interview, I had done a couple of interviews, done an interview with the Iranian uh, media uh, outlet, had done an interview uh, with, uh, uh, it might have been propped, a Russian uh, uh, newspaper there, uh, and uh, I'm at now the anti-globalization movement of Russia at their headquarters where we're doing uh, an interview, and that went splendidly, and I think they have some footage from that. And then, the young uh, comrade from, who is the leader of the uh, anti-globalization movement is also a member of the Russian Communist Party. So at that meeting, I got another Medal of Honor from the Russian Communist Party. So I said, I'll take, I'll take it, put it up here, I'll take this one too, right? Uh, uh, because uh, we want all the solidarity we can get, don't we? And if things go bad, we can melt it down the corner. Uh, that's a, a you know bad joke, but the, the comrades were a, enormously open uh, and friendly, and, uh, and 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 you know one can easily uh, think that well maybe this is a show that they just put on for me because I was brought there right uh, by them, and I'm convinced that the Russians are aware of this ideological war that they involved in with America. I'm aware of it. Uh, and uh, so one could think that, but uh, shortly after I got back, I'm at the credit union, uh, and I run into a classmate of mine from whom I haven't seen in many, many, many years. I've seen one time before now uh, since 19, 1950 or something. And so I run into her, we reckon just happened to see him talking, and she said, I thought you could be in Nigeria. And I said, no, I just got back from, uh, from, from Russia. She said, where were you, in Moscow? She said, oh, have you ever been to this place? I said, well, you've been to Russia. I said, yeah, I've been to Russia. You know, I've been to Moscow, I've been to St. Petersburg, and, uh, and went there on my own. And she said, wow, see, America is full of lies. I said, what do you mean? She said, the thing they say about Russia and Russians, they are full of lies. She said that I have never seen such an open people as I met when I was in Russia. She said, I'm sure you notice it that when the Russians hug you, they really hug you, don't you? I said, they didn't hug me like they hug you. Because she looked a hell of a lot better than I did, right? Uh, but uh, that, was the, that was the point that, that she, was, she was making. She had the same experience. And she wasn't there uh, as some kind of political force. She was there as uh, some teacher on some other thing. And she was by herself running into Russians uh, on, the, on the subway and other things like that. So it was a magnificent uh, meeting, quite successful, and uh, we have uh, participated in trying to introduce the struggle for national liberation of African people in this country, uh, not only to Russians, but to the allies of Russia. We ran into Venezuelans there in the subway, took some pictures, propaganda pictures with the Venezuelans because they're supporting some struggle that's happening in that region, that held up a thing where we embraced each other, that kind of thing. I met with the Motherland Party. Uh, and the head of the Motherland Party is also the head of the, of the Stalingrad Club. Uh, and many of these are people from uh, the Soviet era who hold up, uh, and all the people, most of the people in Russia love Stalin. They love Stalin, the one that, you know, all of us are taught that we're supposed to hate and what have you. Uh, and uh, so I met at the Stalingrad uh, Club, uh, that was a great meeting, uh, quite open, and people are experience, expressing all kinds of political solidarity. And that's the thing that we want to build on and develop. So I wanted to say that, and I think I have to get out of the way now. Am I on, on, on time? Uh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely on time. So uh, we'll move the agenda forward, and I thank you for your patience and listening to me. Uhuru. I know you can do better than that. Chairman O'Malley is a fellow. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, 
about, um, you know, film captures spontaneity forever. And uh, we'll give you an opportunity to uh, watch this video. It's about 23 minutes long of uh, the chairman uh, in Moscow. And uh, a couple of the things that he spoke about, you'll have an opportunity to, to see, like the changing of the guard and uh, et cetera. And uh, right after this video, we're going to take you live uh, to Moscow uh, with the comrades that uh, the chairman had an opportunity to spend some time with. Uhuru. United forever, Moscow, friendship river. and labor, a mighty republic will ever endure. The great the Soviet Union will live through the ages, the dream of a people, their fortress secure. Long live our Soviet motherland. By the people's mighty hand Long live our people United and free Strong in our friendship Pride by fire Long may our crimson flag inspire Shining in glory For all men to see Through days dark and stormy while great Lenin led us, our eyes saw the bright sun of freedom above. And Stalin, our leader, with faith in the people, inspired us to build up the land that we love. What does this represent, Chairman? It's an eternal flame for those who fell uh, during the Second Imperialist War. They're going to have a changing of the guard in 10 minutes. They have a tradition of how that happens, and they're going to be doing that within the next 10 minutes. That's an eternal flame. If you can see, that's the symbol of the sword itself. Yeah. Crowd, so it'll impact on the visible.
Present the Hero Cities. This is Leningrad. And this represents Crimea. Here. This is Crimea here. What is this one saying? Cities of which? Warrior glory. Warrior glory. Yes. Okay. Protecting themselves kill the last drop of blood and this one is where he is heroes from. Okay. Work with heroes. Yeah. Build the red bull, Yeah. I'll tell you, 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 I'll tell
see this one? Yeah, they have Africa yeah. on the world here. Yeah. Yeah. Sure that's yeah. Yeah. See, see the outline of Africa. Yeah. 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 Sasha said to me that you are from the Socialist Party. African in... People's Socialist Party, okay. yes. Yeah. We are from Venezuela. From the good, to party. good to see you. Okay. It's 1917 to 1947. Russian Orthodox Church of St. George. The statue is American, Russian, German and French. Anti Hitler Coalition. And this is a central museum. It's an obelisk type object. Brought into this museum. It's a huge building. Go to Kiev. That's what the sign says. Bloodiest battle of the war. This here was a protection line of German forces. Group Army Center. Group of Army Center. Central Group of Army. Some are not shown. Америка стала союзником Советского Союза в борьбе с фашистской Германией. И наш дорогой товарищ Пошали ищет yes. вас, пред, председатель Социалистической партии Америки. Эта партия всегда была в сотрудничестве с Коммунистической партией Советского Союза. Поэтому позвольте ему, как представителю именно прогрессивной части Америки вручить нашу медаль 70 лет победы над фашистской Германией. Василий Иванович, покажи всем и скажи, что мы не линчуем, а защищаем друг друга. Удостоверение. Все, что что он не украл, а ему вручили. how the United States promote, States promotes itself around the world as a beacon for democracy. And, and it is very difficult for us to understand how it should be believable that the economic project of the United States is one that should be emulated by countries and peoples throughout the world. As I, be as I began this discussion, I started with a statement that I hoped would reveal that the United States itself was created as a predatory state. It is because I am convinced if most people understood this, 
it would be easier to understand the activities of the United States throughout the world. How it has ushered in a period of unending war. Uh, that has resulted in crises everywhere. And that has also, as a sign of this crisis, resulted in the selection of Barack Hussein Obama as the modern face of U.S. imperialism. It is a case of U.S. imperialism, which is the world hegemon, which is the leadership of Western imperialism. It is a case of of U.S. imperialism disguising itself in the face of the colonized and the oppressed. So, I'm here because for at least uh, 50 years of my life, I have been struggling in the United States to overturn this relationship that Africans and other oppressed people have to the United States government. And uh, have attempted to do this in solidarity with oppressed and exploited people throughout the world. So I want to thank you again for offering me this opportunity uh, to speak to you, uh, to share ideas, and also to learn from you. The only other thing I would say to you is that I am a revolutionary. Which means that a long time ago uh, I have come to a conclusion that the United States will never ever voluntarily or willingly provide freedom or peace for anyone on the planet Earth, including uh, those of us who live within the, United, the borders of the United States itself.
and the United States and other European powers forced Haiti to pay reparations to France for its property. Do you know what the property that France lost that it had to pay reparations for? Slaves, black people who made the first successful workers' revolution, the first successful uh, anti-slave re rebellion in the world. And then when it happened, they had to pay reparations to France because the, uh, a quarantine, economic quarantine, was imposed on Haiti by America, by France, by all of the European powers, including Germany and, and everybody else. So they starved Haiti and to having to pay France. How can France, how can any of them get away with talking about Russia and Ukraine or anything else like that with, with that kind of history? This is the argument that I'm making. That I think that, that if, if people would make America have to face, look in the mirror, force America to look in the mirror, if it had to look in the mirror, it couldn't be looking at Crimea. I think that it's a really hard, hard task to do. Because, because okay, uh, I think that American government understand the real situation and they understand the real history and understand the, the real, real place. But it's not the government. It's not who we're talking about. But here's what forces the government. Here's how the Soviet Union did it. The Soviet Union, the American government is in a contest. It's not some, it wants to think there's a unipolar world, but it's not unipolar. That's why Russia is such a concern, that's why China is such a concern. Other forces are rising up today, and America is on the defensive now, trying to show why the American system is the ideal system, it's the best system, yeah, it's the so great system. So when Russia and other countries begin to show solidarity as the Soviet Union did, show solidarity with the oppressed peoples around the world, then America had to defend itself from, from the peoples around the world. Had to defend itself, not, not to the American people, but it had to defend itself to the next victim of American policy, wherever that was in the world. And so what it did was give strength to people who were struggling against America and forced America to make certain kinds of concessions or at least to pretend it was something that it was not. That's what I'm saying. So I'm not talking about the Americans know it. They, of course the Americans know it. But do, uh, and the other thing is that as long as America can do this and get away with it, people in other places around the world feel isolated and then are less encouraged to fight back. But if Africans in Baltimore knew that Russians were siding with them, I'll tell you what happened after Ferguson. That was extraordinarily inspirational to African people. The Palestinian, the popular front for the liberation of Palestine sent solidarity with black people in America fighting against the U.S. empire. The, the, the government of, of Iran uh, talked about it, and even in the Russian parliament there was a discussion about sending a peacekeeping team uh, to America to look out for the interests of African people there. This, this kind of political uh, act, which is an ideological assault on this whole notion of what America tries to pretend to be, that's where, that's where our ability uh, and our unity uh, uh, are so important. You know? I'm hoping we uh, succeed in connecting with the comrades in Moscow. Um, I'd, I'd like for you to have an opportunity uh, to meet them, and I think it would be important for them uh, to be able to make this contact as well. It's been stated that there's a good possibility uh, that I'll be back in Moscow in September, and they're in the process of uh, well, possibly organizing uh, an uh, ability for me to speak before uh, one of the state uh, 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 legislatures uh, in Moscow. Uh, so uh, I'm anxious to be able uh, to do that. So uh, I don't know if there's uh, anything that we got. All right, splendid. We connected. Uhuru. 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 Скажи. Я приветствую от имени антиглобалистского движения России, всех участников сегодняшнего мероприятия. Передаю большой привет товарищу Омали и всем его соратникам. Ухуру! 
uh, greetings in the name of anti-globalization movement of Russia to everybody who participates in our uh, today b today's broadcast uh, and I greet personally our dear comrade uh, Omali and every one of his comrades Uhuru Я благодарен, что сегодня мне позволили выступить перед uh, нашими друзьями и Я прошу прощения, что не могу э, говорить на английском, но я надеюсь, что мы сможем друг друга понять. I'm really grateful for this opportunity to talk to our friends. Uh, it's uh, pity that I cannot speak English yet by myself, but I believe we'll be able to understand each other. Мир меняется, но меняется он не в лучшую сторону. The world is changing. It is changing to the worse. Капиталистическая монополия достигла своего апогея. Капиталист монополи has reached its apogee, its, uh, its boiling point. Неоколониализм сегодня причина геноцида малых народов в странах по всему миру. Неоколониализм uh, is the reason of genocide of small nations worldwide. Это причина и гуманитарных катастроф. It is the reason for uh, humanitarian catastrophes also. Изощренные глобалистские амбиции правительства США и их союзников убивают традиционные ценности и подменяют культурные, этнические и другие каноны по всему миру. The ambitions U.S. and uh, U.S. government and its allies have are destroying people, destroying traditions around the world. Я встречался за последние пять лет с двенадцатью президентами. Within the last twelve years, I have met uh, twelve presidents. И все они говорили о новом мировом порядке, который сейчас мы видим, видим его сегодня. Everyone, uh, each of these presidents was uh, talking to me about the new world order which we witness today. Они говорили о том, что мы должны бороться. They were telling me that we must fight. Бороться за свои права. We must fight for our Бороться за другие народы, за своих союзников. Fight for other nations, fight uh, for our allies. И создать многополярный мир. In order to create multipolar world. Малком X говорил. Малком uh, X said. Никто не может дать тебе свободу. Nobody can give you freedom. Никто не даст тебе равенство. Nobody will give you equality. Никто не даст тебе справедливость. Nobody will give you justice. Если ты мужчина, возьми их сам. If you are a man, you should take it by yourself. Сейчас по всему миру народы объединяются. As of today, nations around the world are uniting. Для того, чтобы противостоять однополярному мировому компоненту. Uniting to stand against unipolar world. Мы видим политику двойных стандартов в мире. We see the politics of double standards in this world. Мы видим, как на Ближнем Востоке с одной стороны поднимают голову ИГИЛ. In Middle East we see from one side this head of uh, ISIS is rising. С этими экстремистами, по идее, должен бороться весь мир. Uh, it would seem that whole world should be fighting these extremists. Но мы видим, как uh, Америка проводит военные операции не в Ираке или Сирии, а наоборот потворствуют этим организациям, поставляют туда деньги, лекарства и оружие. But we see that the United States government is not uh, fighting them in Iraq or Syria, but instead providing them with weapons, money and medications. И uh, мы видим, как с другой стороны uh, в Йемене 
когда люди собрались для того, чтобы освободить свою страну от прозападного правительства. From another point, we see Yemen, where people have gathered to liberate their country from a pro-Western government. Америка собрала коалицию через Лигу Арабских Государств. United States have used a League of Arab States in order to create coalition. И начала бомбежки Йемена. To start bombing Yemen. Для того, чтобы вернуть президента Йемена обратно на его пост. In order to reinstate uh, betrothed president of Yemen. Почему же тогда с Украиной они так не сделали? Why they didn't do the same for Ukraine? Почему, когда Янукович бежал в Россию? Why, when Yanukovych has escaped to Russia? Сенатор Маккейн Сенатор Маккейн have greeted uh, so-called rebels on uh, Maidan Square in Ukraine, in Kyiv. А Виктория Нуланд раздавала там булочки. And Victoria Nuland was delivering some uh, cakes there, cookies. А теперь посмотрим uh, на гуманитарную ситуацию. Now let's see uh, the humanitarian situation. В Йемене она катастрофическая. In Yemen it's complete nightmare. Как и в Ираке, как и в Ливии, как и в Сирии. In Iraq and Libya in Syria the same. Но посмотрите, несмотря на то, что есть политика санкций, несмотря на то, что сейчас Запад во главе с США ведет против нас информационную и экономическую войну, граждан США из Йемена эвакуировала российская авиация. But uh, look, uh, no, never, no matter the policy of sanctions, no matter this uh, never-ending info wars against Russia, United States citizens were evacuated from Yemen by Russian aviation. Я сейчас не хочу отстаивать только позицию России и говорить, что только Запад плохой. I don't want right now to stand uh, just by position of Russia and claiming that okay, West is bad, only bad. Я хочу сказать вам факты. I just want to deliver you some facts. Если кто-то хочет, тот может убедиться в правоте. И if one willing to find out, he will find out the truth. Я помню, как 29 государств НАТО бомбили и гвоздили Ливию томагавками, нарушая нормы международного права. I remember 29 NATO countries uh, bombing Libya with uh, Tomahawk missiles, uh, regardless of any international laws. И в тот момент нам удалось поговорить с семьей Каддафи. At that moment, we had a chance to uh, talk to the family of Gaddafi. И они нам сказали. They told us. Сади сказал Каддафи. Сади Каддафи, uh, Муаммар Каддафи's son told us. Они убивают нас за то, they are killing us, что мы хотим объединить африканские народы. Because we want to unite African nations. За то, что мы хотим изгнать из Ближнего Востока экстремистов. Because we want to get rid of extremists in Middle East. За то, что мы хотим бороться за наши права и за то, чтобы африканские компании начали наконец создавать рабочие места и поднимать экономику своих стран. Because we want to fight for our rights, we want to fight for the rights of African people, so that African companies, African governments would work to improve the life of their citizens. Мы видели огромный, чего стоит только один проект, рукотворная река, который был построен при Каддафи, который обеспечил людей самым главным в пустыне, водой, через всю Ливию. We saw the great project, uh, the great river of Muammar Gaddafi, built by his order, in order to deliver uh, water to the desert lands of this country. И сейчас все это разрушено. And now, 
everything is destroyed. Только вывозится нефть из Ливии. Only oil is getting extracted from Libya. Я долгое время знал сейчас уже умершего помощника Саддама Хусейна, доктора Аббаса Халуфа. I knew for a long time, uh, now late, uh, Abbas Khalouf, he was assistant for Saddam Hussein. Он поработал с Саддамом Хусейном 25 лет. He worked for Saddam Hussein over 25 years. И он сказал, если бы тогда Саддам бы не поддался бы на американские провокации и не начал бы войну с Ираном, сейчас он был бы жив. And he told me, that if Saddam Hussein would not follow uh, US provocation, would not go to war against Iran, he will be, uh, he will stay alive up now. И когда была Генеральная Ассамблея ООН, Каддафи порвал устав ООН и выбросил его, потому что ООН перестал выполнять свои функции. С момента основания ООН в мире произошло более 70 военных конфликтов, в которых погибло людей практически столько же, сколько во времена Великой Отечественной и Второй мировой войны. During one of the General Assembly of United Nations, uh, Muammar Gaddafi tore uh, the uh, book of United Nations uh, because uh, this institute uh, completely fail to perform its uh, initial missions. For example, uh, in World War II, millions of people have died, but after World War II, there were at least 70 military conflicts, and uh, nobody done anything to prevent them. More people died, more people died than in World War II. И в России сейчас выпустили хорошую книгу, она посвящена Чавесу. In Russia they have just published new book dedicated to Hugo Chavez. Эту книгу выпустило правительство. This book is released by government. Я хотел бы прочитать одну цитату из нее. I would like to quote you one uh, quote from this book. Мы должны восстановить ценности солидарность и любовь между нами, а не завести ненависть и индивидуализм. We must uh, restore uh, peace and understanding between ourselves, uh, between ourselves, and uh, not to fight for individualism. Сейчас мы должны все объединяться ради одной идеи. We must... и мира. We must now unite for one idea, for justice and peace. Мы видим, как через СМИ сейчас пытаются подменить всю позицию Соединенных Штатов в отношении прав человека. We uh, witness these days how uh, in media, mass media, uh, they are trying to distort U.S. picture. Uh, US country uh, position on human rights. Америка готовит постоянно доклады о нарушении прав человека в других странах, в том числе и в России. United States government constantly delivering reports about violations of human rights in every country, especially Russia. Но по моему личному мнению, Америка сейчас является основным государством, где прорастает сегрегация. But in my own opinion, uh, United States is the main state now, uh, the state uh, where segregation is growing. Где нарушаются и попираются нормы права и права человека. Where human rights are being violated. Мы солидарны с Мумием Абдул Джамалем. We are in solidarity with Mumia Abu Jamal. Мы солидарны с нашим гражданином России Константином Ярошенко, которого американские спецслужбы похитили из Африки и пытались пытками из него выбить до обвинительные признания, в свою очередь, и обвинили yeah. его на 20 лет. We are in solidarity with our citizen, Russian citizen Константин Ярошенко, uh, kidnapped from Africa by United States Secret Services. Uh, tortured and sentenced for 20 years over falsified case. 
Америка тем самым доказала, что она не признает суверенитет ни одной африканской страны, когда нарушала его в Либерии и в других странах э, Африки. United States have uh, proven that uh, they do not care for sovereignty of other countries when uh, they violated sovereignty of Liberia and other African countries. И завершая свое выступление, and finishing my speech, я хотел бы еще раз призвать о том, чтобы наши организации во всех странах шли друг другу навстречу, делали тот самый шаг навстречу. Правительства не могут нас разъединить. Все справедливые силы и патриотические силы должны объединяться. I would like to call upon uh, our organizations, upon our people to unite. Uh, governments cannot divide us. We as people, as societies, as communities must unite. Бжезинский говорил, новый мировой порядок будет строиться против России и на обломках России. Бжезинский have told that new world order will be built uh, against Russia and uh, on the ashes of Russia. Но мы этого не допустим. But we will not allow this to happen. Как и не допустим того, чтобы наших союзников и братьев убивали где бы то ни было, на Ближнем Востоке, в Африке и в Латинской Америке. As we will not allow our friends, our allies, our comrades to be killed uh, in Middle East, in Africa, in Latin America. Тысячи людей выходят против войны и нарушения прав человека по всему миру. Thousands of people go into the streets uh, protesting against the war and human rights violation around the world. И настало время объединения. Сделаем друг другу шаг навстречу. Ухуру! It is time to unite. Let us make uh, one step closer to each other. Ухуру! Uh, we travel all over Moscow, and uh, I was speaking earlier about, about what gracious uh, hosts uh, they were, and uh, just the warm uh, embrace that we received uh, from the Russian people while there. And I also think it's really important to say that uh, the trip that we just made uh, to Russia and to Moscow, uh, was a really important trip because uh, we wanted to establish a connection uh, between uh, the Russian people uh, and the various other organizations uh, in Russia uh, with the actual uh, African liberation movement. That we know uh, that uh, the anti-globalization movement of uh, Russia, for example, has been in contact uh, with various uh, forces in the United States. Uh, and I'm happy to say that one of those contacts with, was with Sister Margaret Kimberly, who is with Black Agenda Report and with the Black is Back Coalition. And uh, she played a, a really important role uh, in our going to Moscow uh, as well. But the thing is that uh, uh, the Russians or any other people, uh, most other people around the world, uh, have only been able to be in touch with uh, uh, African liberals or people who are in the camp of uh, imperialism, uh, who are interested in trying to reform imperialism uh, rather than uh, understanding the necessity to be involved uh, in a struggle for uh, the liberation of our people. Africans not only here, but throughout the continent of Africa. Uh, uh, the comrade mentioned Malcolm X, uh, who was uh, one of the leaders that helped to establish the national liberation movement around the world, but who was murdered by the United States government. Uh, then there was even people like Martin Luther King, murdered by the United States government. Uh, there was an organization, the Black Panther Party, destroyed, assassinated by the, Black, uh, by the United States government. There was Patrice Lumumba, hunted like an animal and murdered in the Congo by the United States government. Uh, there was Kwame Nkrumah, uh, who was the first uh, independent, uh, president of independent Ghana, overthrown by the United States government and later poisoned. Uh, so there has, uh, after all of this,
this. After the capture of a wounded uh, Che Guevara and his assassination and all of the damage that they've done around the world, uh, most of the people around the world have not had an opportunity to be in touch with the African Liberation Movement. So they would meet people who were fundamentally representatives of the United States government and not representatives of the revolutionary movement of African people. And our presence in Moscow uh, allowed us to uh, reestablish contact between the Russian people and the African revolution here and in various other places around the world. So it was really important for us to be uh, in uh, Moscow and these were really important comrades. So, uh, I don't know if there's anything that uh, you're here, you have an opportunity, the comrades, I think they can, they can hear us. Uh, if you wanted to raise uh, any kinds of questions or uh, make any kind of observations, uh, uh, the comrades uh, there in Moscow, this is an opportunity to do that. Why don't you come up here, so that, because uh, you're being live streamed. Come here, just step right here. Yeah. Sure. About the uh, dismantling of Marxist principles within the uh, former Soviet Union, uh, that they don't practice Marxism, that they don't believe in, and there's a free market. What do you speak to that? And what your observations were while you were there? I think that's generally true. Uh, but to say that the Soviet, the, the Russian government, the Soviet government has been dismantled. Uh, and the government in place is not a socialist government, it's not a Marxist government or anything like that. Uh, but it was the socialist revolution that uh, brought uh, Russia into uh, modern history. It was the socialist revolution that uh, overturned uh, the uh, uh, semi feudal state of uh, the Tsar and introduced modernity uh, to Russia. And regardless of whether there is a Marxist or socialist government in power, uh, the Russian character has been shaped uh, by the influence of uh, the Russian Revolution. It is a society that came into existence through revolution, where you look at uh, most of the European society came into existence as bourgeois societies uh, based on colonialism, and in this country, it's a society that was based on stealing land from the indigenous people, Mexico, uh, and then enslaving people. And that's the thing that many people outside of America do not understand. They like to treat America conceptually uh, as their own countries. They think that America came through the same experience and it came from an entirely different experience. And they would do better to understand America as being uh, a society much more similar uh, to uh, Israel, uh, to the South Africa, where Europeans go there, set up a state on somebody else's land, get fat off somebody else's resources. It's not like Russia. And it's not even, uh, and so I think that's really important. So Marxism uh, is not a, 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 the prevailing uh, uh, system uh, there. But I want to tell you one of the best things happened to me on this trip that I did not mention. Um, I've forgotten exactly where we were coming from, uh, but we got caught in the rain. And so we went uh, uh, in an underpass uh, to escape from the rain. And in this, un un this underpass, there were these shops that was there. You know, people could you know, buy all kinds of stuff. And, and one of the shops was a bookstore, an old bookstore. You know, that you can probably only find uh, uh, maybe in Europe or uh, uh, maybe, you know, like someplace like Russia. And Comrade Alex, I saw him talking and negotiating something uh, with the person who ran the bookstore. And so after, and I'm just, just uh, really sightseeing in the underpass. And then after a while, Alex comes up to me and he gives me uh, this gift. And this gift is uh, two volumes of uh, works, first edition works by Karl Marx in Russian. <laughs> so I said, this guy knows how to seduce me, right? <laughs> but, uh, uh, but seeing this, I would also say that uh, more than half the population in Russia uh, really look up to Stalin. Stalin, that's who they look up to. And uh, 
Uh, and I think that's really important to say something. And even Putin uh, has expressed uh, regret for the disappearance of the Soviet Union uh, himself. So they're not socialists, but they're extraordinarily patriotic. Nationalism uh, is very deep in Russia. Patriotism is very deep uh, uh, in Russia. And, and Obama and anybody who thinks that they can march into uh, Moscow, march into the Soviet Union, or they can break the spirit or the will uh, of the Russian people uh, with these so-called sanctions, they're out of their minds. They're absolutely insane. That, that would not happen. Uh, that's not the Russia that I just left. I hope Slava is, uh, is also involved right now uh, in translating. Slava was the one who was uh, translating for us for the duration for my, the entire time I was there. Uhuru, Sister Dolores. Uhuru, uh, as I uh, watched the, when they first started this call the election to elect that guy that they wanted to be president of the U.S., the Russian people, well, the people told them, we're Russian. But they, the day of the election, they broke the machine, they shut down some of the polls, they did everything they could take of these poor people to discourage them. And they came on CNN, and this Russian woman, a mother looked like, stocky woman, like 30, 40 years, and she said, we're not going nowhere. We're going to stay right here, we're going to vote. We are Russian now, we are Russian then, and we'll be Russian from now on. Yeah. And hey, they are great people. Yeah. yeah, for real. Yeah. yeah. They're crazy. They're crazy if they think that they can break the will of the Russian people like that. They're out of their minds. They're, they're drinking something illegal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know if the uh, uh, comrades, uh, Alex, uh, want to say anything? Is there anybody else who wants to raise any questions before we uh, move forward? Um, I, I cannot uh, express just how generous uh, these comrades were, the comrades who uh, functioned as, as my host. Uh, they took me places that uh, I don't think that people who tour uh, Moscow normally go. Uh, I had an opportunity to meet extraordinary forces, and that was what was so magnificent because uh, the kind of uh, the the the, uh, the the cross section of the population that we had an opportunity to meet there. I mean, you know, uh, I was there until three o'clock in the morning. I'm up with the black with the night wolves, a motorcycle club, right? And, and these comrades were uh, just extraordinary. They're, they're, as I said, they're, they're patriots, uh, and they express uh, extreme solidarity. And the Night Wolves is the first uh, motorcycle club that's ever been registered uh, in Russia. And uh, so there were, uh, but there are thousands of them. And so they're in Russia, and then there were also Serbian uh, Night Wolves. And there were comrades from Serbia who were you know, there in, in the compound of the Night Wolves, and this is an organization that does tremendous work, uh, uh, like with children. Uh, they have their own line of, uh, of clothing. They, uh, they uh, do, uh, what do you call them, uh, concerts and, and things like that. Uh, uh, it's just a really important and, and, and extraordinary force, and they're highly political. Yes. I've read uh, much about the African presence within Moscow and throughout Russia. Um, I know there's an elected official a few years back who he made history of being the first uh, African elected to a uh, mayor of a town. Did you see any Africans uh, in Moscow and throughout Russia and parts that you visited? And is there still a Patrice Lumumba School of Warfare that you've seen that, that was prevalent throughout the uh, 60s and 70s? I, I, the place that I was, that I spoke, uh, the university, it was once uh, the Patrice Lumumba University. It is no longer Patrice Lumumba University. It is, I think, something like the Russian uh, Friendship uh, University, Russian People's Friendship University, or something like that. So it's no longer the Patrice Lumumba. Uh, and uh, the first Africans I met when I was there were uh, two brothers from uh, Ethiopia. Uh, one had been in Ethiopia for, uh, in Moscow for 24 years, and the other for 29 years. And I think that's a statement of something about what they found uh, in, in Russia. 
The only other African I had a direct contact with uh, was a sister uh, who uh, uh, worked at a restaurant uh, where we ate. And uh, she was just somebody who was kind of obvious to me. There was no formal meeting, but I did ask her, you know, like how she got, how she got the name that she, she had. And uh, she told me her father was from France. Uh, uh, and that's not saying much because Africans from France come from someplace else, just like Africans in this country come from someplace else. And uh, her father had been dead for three years, and she said uh, her stepfather was uh, from Nigeria. Uh, so, I mean, that was sort of like an African presence there. And uh, uh, so I didn't have an opportunity, but there is such a place called Pushkin, uh, I think it's Pushkin Square. Are people here for me with, uh, with Alexander Pushkin, uh, who uh, was uh, an African uh, who actually could be considered like the father of Russian literature. Uh, and there's a statue of him there, and I brought back some uh, Pushkin chocolate uh, as gifts uh, to some of the comrades who are here. Uh, uh, so that, that was the only thing I saw. I didn't have an opportunity. Uh, to meet with, uh, with Africans, you know, other than that, while I was there. Uh, so, uh, Alex, okay, we want Alex to go ahead and say a few things before we close it out, and I understand that... Uh, Uhuru, I just want to say Uhuru to Alex and Slava, and really want to thank you from the Central Committee of the African People's Socialist Party. <laughs> okay. From the Central Committee of the African People's Socialist Party for taking care of our chair, our chairman. We think that this alliance that we are forming right now is timely and it's very, very important in the lives of African people. And we expect um, to have a, a long um, alliance with the Russian people um, because uh, as our chairman taught us that we are in the final offensive of imperialism and we just look forward to moving into the future into a new world so we want to really thank you for you know for taking care of our chairman and for the gracious um, you know your graciousness so Alex I have these flyers uh, which we have delivered on our uh, demonstrations in Moscow. Многие люди в России солидарны с активистами в Фергюсоне и Балтиморе. Many people in Russia are in solidarity with activists in Ferguson and Baltimore. И сегодня мы стоим плечом к плечу для того, чтобы бороться с Расизм, сегрегация и с нарушением прав человека. And today we stand side by side in order to fight uh, racism, segregation and human rights violations. И мы дадим жесткий отпор тем, кто еще болеет uh, колониали... колониализмом. And we will stand against those uh, who are promoting neo-colonialism. Мы будем бороться с теми, кто хочет делить людей по национальному признаку, по цвету их кожи и по их вероисповеданию. We will fight those who want to divide people by uh, a racial basis or by skin color or by religious bias. Мы будем выступать за сохранение африканской культуры. We will stand uh, by saving of African cultures. И сегодня для uh, активистов Ухуру справедлив лозунг. And today for activists of Uhuru uh, the slogan is working. Там, где мы, там Африка. Where uh, the place we are in, it's the place of Africa. Uhuru. Uhuru. Uh, so, uh, can I, uh, comrades, it's, uh, we're going to close the meeting now, but I want to express again our deep uh, appreciation to you 
to your participation and uh, we'll be talking more about how we can uh, become uh, more involved in United Actions. Uh, I'm also um, looking forward to a similar participation uh, by the anti-globalization movement of Russia, uh, Comrade Alex and Slavo, uh, uh, in August with the Black and Black Coalition will be uh, having our conference in Philadelphia. And I'm hoping that you'll be able to speak to that conference uh, in Philadelphia uh, in the same way that you were able uh, to speak to us here today. I think it's important for us to have these public demonstrations of solidarity uh, between the, the Russian people and the actual struggle of African people who are engaged uh, in fighting for peace and for liberation. So we want to express our deepest uh, appreciation to you and uh, we want to continue to talk. I'm looking forward to the possibility of being in Moscow in September. Uh, and certainly uh, looking forward to your participation with us uh, with the Black is Back conference that's going to be held in August uh, in Philadelphia. Uhuru. Uhuru. Long live the solidarity between the African and Russian people. Uhuru. Uhuru.